will now introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe. Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe invented and patented a robotic system which the United States government acquired assignee rights. Dr. Ekwekwe holds two doctoral and four master's degrees, including a PhD in engineering from John Hopkins University, United States of America. He earned an undergraduate degree from Federal University of Technology, Owiri, where he graduated as his best, his class best students. While in analog devices scope, he co-designed an accelerometer for the iPhone, a recipient of IGI Global Book of the Year Award, a TED Fellow, IBM Global Entrepreneur, and World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. Professor Ekekwe has held professorship in Carnegie Mellon University and Babcock University, and served in the United States National Science Foundation Committee. The South African press called him a doctor of innovation for helping organizations on the mechanics of business innovation, strategy, and growth. Since 2009, the chairman of Fast Micro Group, which controls many startups and ent entities have, have been writing in the Harvard Business Review. He was recognized by the Guardian as one of 60 Nigerians making the Nigerian lives matter on Nigeria's 60th independence. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's quite a great privilege and honor to come here to have this conversation with everyone. I am standing on existing protocol. The NSC is a very great institution and the Society of Engineers because engineers build nations and inviting me to come here to share with you, I want to say thank you so much. And I also want to thank the local leaders for everything that we have been doing as a people to make sure that we continue that thing, that mission to build a dynamic country in our beautiful country, Nigeria. So I just want to share a slide here as we move straight into the conversation that we have today. And I have titled it, engineers turn entrepreneurs. And I'm taking it back from one of the finest courses I took in Federal University of Technology where we studied in our third year in the university program there. They have a course they call engineer, um, engineer turn managers. And that engineer turn managers basically was trying to take us into a new nation of not just becoming the builders and the makers, but also taking us into the constructs that engineers also have to be managers in math. So today we want to take it, not just becoming managers, but we also want to become entrepreneurs. So I will begin by showing us the world map. If you look into this beautiful map here, you see that there are many, many beautiful things. And Right there, you see the great cities of London, the great cities of Glasgow, the great cities of New York City, and the great city of Lagos, Omaha, Ogadagu, and Nairobi. You can just name them. But in, inside them also, there are massive level of paralysis. These are problems that are evident in our world, the problems of lack of adequate electricity, the problem of lack of clean water, the problems that mothers are still dying when they are giving birth to, to very beautiful babies. So the world is full of challenges. The world is full of frictions. And the question here becomes, how do we overcome those frictions? How do we solve them? How do we fix them? It turns out that one of the mechanics of fixing those frictions or the challenges that we have in the world has to go through the path of market system. The path of market system is basically saying here that a group of people, they see problems, but they also come up with solutions that can actually go and attack those problems. And when they do that, they overcome the frictions in our communities and the society also rewards them because in the process of solving those problems, 
they also do good to society and also do good to themselves. That is the whole construct of entrepreneurial capitalism. It constructs that problems in society are opportunities. And those who can create products and services to overcome them are going to become really, really successful, at least within the financial space. So I will take you back to the history financially of the world over the last 2,000 years. You can see that empires come, empires disappear. At the time, the richest nations in the world, they were from Asia. There was a time the largest economy in the world was dominated by India, dominated by China, and then it came the time the Europeans took over. Today, America is the dominant global economy. So what is happening here is that across these centuries, countries were developing, deploying capabilities and market system that made it possible for them to solve problems at scale at a way that other countries cannot do. And when they have those capacities to solve those problems at scale, they also accumulate a lot of value for themselves. When you go into a community and that community is made up of doers, people that are not just writing articles, talking about challenges they are having, but they are people that believe that they can go in, in and go and attack that problem through their own ideas and ingenuity. You realize one thing, they get things done and those societies actually improve. So the world has been in a state of flux. And over the last 10 centuries, China dominated at least six of those centuries. Because towards the late 19th century, America took over and America ruled the 20th century. But the American century is nothing but a century of entrepreneurs. And those entrepreneurs, many of them are engineers. They were the pioneers in markets by helping us to build new domains and market systems that have never happened before. The space, the aeronautics, the microelectronics. If you go through their history, you see that until engineers can build, until engineers can lead, nations cannot rise. Go back many centuries ago, during the great time and the great debate of the Greek philosophers, they were trying to understand the elemental constructs of the universe. And I recall one of the first subjects, of courses I took in photo, Professor Asiebu came into the class, a professor of philosophy. He told us something, that the Greek philosophers were trying to answer one question, what is the material component of the universe? What is this world made up of? There were a lot of postulations from Thales, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Pythagoras gave us that the world is made up of numbers. The world is made up of numbers. And if the world is made up of numbers, the implication is that everything we do in life is nothing but numbers. The numbers of medicine is the business of medicine. The numbers of retail is the business of retail. The numbers in agriculture is the business of agriculture. And that means that if numbers rule and what, it means computing, manipulating, processing numbers will become the work of societies. Must have gone through human history from Abacus to slide rule, the indifference engine, to ENIAC, to UNIAC, to the invention of transistor in 1937 by Shockley, to the invention of integrated circuits by Robert Nose and Intel Jackman. So at the end of the whole thing, we are building. Through that history of Robert Noyce and Jao Kibi of Texas Instruments, engineers have shaped our world. And when those engineers are shaping our world, if your own society does not have those engineers leading, you are not going to get the benefit of that transformation and that innovation system that we are witnessing. And I will explain this in a very simple plot. If you look out here, just plotted 2,000 years of GDP. I use United States of America and China because today they are the two most dominant economics in our world. Right here, you could see that the GDP of the United States was flat over centuries. 
and the GDP of China was also flat marginally over centuries. And what that means is the people that lived here were poorer than people that lived here. People that lived here were poorer than people that lived here because as population was increasing, the GDP was flat. And if GDP was flat when population was increasing, it means that the per second income was decelerating. In other words, people here had little to share because the GDP was flat even when population was increasing. You must have read about Reverend Marcus, the agricultural science in secondary school, in second year in secondary school, where he said that the world was going to run out of food because the food production was going in arithmetic progression. Why? Human population was going in geometric progression. And that geometric progression means that one day food we will not have. But I have called this the invention society era. This is the era where there were so many ideas in the world. Some of the, the finest models, some of the finest constructs, some of the hypotheses that we have in physics, chemistry, mathematics. The men that live here, the women that live here created them. But many of them died poor. The world was in a state of absolute poverty because man, woman, they, we are becoming poorer. These invention society, they were there, but they were very brilliant. If you go back to your physics, everything there, they build them. But just forward a little bit, the same flattened GDP, the same flattened GDP started going exponentially. What happened? What happened? Why was it that they lived all these centuries flat, all of a sudden they started rising up? And that is going to be a conversation today. For looking at Nigeria specifically, we are still here. We are an inventive society era. An inventive society is a society where there are so many ideas. Go to Molue Park right now in Lagos. Enter into any Taizi, you know, about or Lagos or Potakot. Just go to Kanu. People have ideas how to fix electricity. People have ideas how to provide clean water in Nigeria. People have ideas in beer pilots. People have solved all Nigeria's problems. But wait for next month, next year, nothing has happened because Nigeria is an inventive society. It means that we are very good in the constructs of invention. But invention does not provide food on the table. Invention does not provide that electricity you need in your house. What drives growth, prosperity of nations is innovation. And that means that invention plus commercialization gives you innovation. So what are the things that we not need as engineers to help that nation, to have a society, to become an innovation society because innovation society is a society where people can buy products and services. They created compounds. They help us understand the elements. And when polio came, polio killed them. Many of them, Quebec losses killed them. They died in March, pandemic ravaged them because they had knowledge, but they did not have products. Because they didn't have products, they cannot fix frictions in markets. So when engineers turn to become entrepreneurs, what engineers are now trying to do here is to take up that construct of building things into going into societies to fix frictions which they have. And what do we mean by the frictions in markets? The frictions in nations are those latent opportunities that remain unsolved. In every market system, there is demand and supply. The man who needs something and the person who provides something. But because market system is inherently imperfect, because of what we call information asymmetry, I know that I am hungry and you don't know that I'm hungry. And you know that you have food, but I don't know that you have food. Because of that inability, for market system to know who has what and who needs what, we said that market system naturally is imperfect in nature. It turns out there is only one way of fixing that imperfection is by having companies. And that is where we begin to ask ourselves as engineers, what can we do for our society? 
Because that spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism enables us to build companies. Because companies are the vehicles upon which we can now bring near optimal perfection a market system, making it possible for demand and supply to come into a near perfect equilibrium point for the frictions in market to be fixed. So let me make it very simple here. NBC just left the United States and lands in Lagos tomorrow, and there is no family member of mine that is living in Lagos. Let's also assume there is no restaurant in the city of Lagos. I have one option. One option that NBC is hungry. He needs to start knocking at every person's door looking for somebody who has food to sell. You agree with me, that may not be a very good option. Because I can knock at the first door, they don't have food to sell. I knock at the second door, they don't have food to sell. But at the same time I'm knocking, there is someone who has food. But I may not just knock at his or her door. And that person does not need, does not know that I actually want to eat. We are assuming there is no restaurant. But let's wait. Next two days, a young woman, Mama Kemi's, opens a restaurant. She calls it Mama Kemi's Restaurant. Mama Kemi's Restaurant is a business. So that next time DBC is hungry, instead of knocking at every person's door, DBC goes to Mama Kemi's Restaurant. And now she will prepare food, or koi koi, amala zobo, to wash it. And at the end of the day, DBC pays her for compensating her for fixing that friction of hunger, which I have been looking for somebody to help. So as engineers, we're no more just talking about restaurant business here that somebody is hungry. We're not looking at the elemental constructs that build the pillars of modern societies, that unless we can create those products and services which are usually organized through companies, the friction same markets will remain. And Nigeria has many of them. We have the friction that we have not fixed electricity problem. We've not fixed clean water problem. We've not given our mothers and sisters the opportunity they can walk into hospital. There is no risk that they are delivering babies and they die in that process. So these are all frictions and only entrepreneurs can actually build and deliver services that can actually make them to disappear. And we said that every friction you need to have capabilities to solve them. Because how are you going to build rockets if you don't have skill sets in aerospace and aeronautics? That means that engineers, as they want to become entrepreneurs, they also need to accumulate capabilities. Because the accumulation of capabilities will make it possible for you to organize factors of production to now build specific products that are needed in the market. And we say that as modern engineers, as entrepreneurial engineers, we need knowledge. Knowledge is very critical. And it's one of the most potent factors of production in our generation. And even as we need that knowledge, we also need to have that spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism. We need to have the ability to move into domains and pioneer sectors and solve problems in society. Capital and labor are key. But if you look at it most times, societies always get better when there are pioneers, when there are people that can go forward because of the call of missions they have found themselves in. You go to Carnegie in America, you go to B.Y. Mellon, you go to Rockefeller. These are men. And if you come to Nigeria, you can also see Dan Gote. These are men that are putting so much or they put so much so that they can build a path to do one thing, to organize factors of production, to go and solve and fix pressures in markets. And that organization of factors of production, we do them three, three different cardinals, the people, the processes, and tools. You have to create the tools, you have to create the processes, I have to create. But I want to say something here that is amazing, that as young people in Africa, as young people in Nigeria, they are picking that message. And the message they are picking is this, that if they can identify these frictions in this market, in this world, identify those miracle legs that we have in those lands, they can organize all these factors of production and they can create companies. And when they now create those companies, they begin to solve problems at scale. And as they are solving problems at scale, 
society is also rewarding. You go to Nigeria now, there is this new species of businesses that are called unicorns. It's a special type of animal, except that it's not the typical biological animal. They call it fintechs. They call it logistic tech. They call it whatever they call it, but they are startups. They are worth at least a billion dollars, so huge and so marvelous. And most of them are being mushroomed. Most of them are being released into the world we live. Flutter Wave, OP, Paystack, and all these companies are evolving. And what are they pursuing? They are pursuing that mission of entrepreneurial capitalism. They are pursuing that mission of organizing factors of production to create processes and services that can now help to make society better. And as society is making them better, they become evil whole as themselves. So for engineers that are called into that noble profession, the question for us is this, really. What can we do to restore the dignity of man and woman, just like the University of Nigeria and Soka put it in their mission to restore the dignity. And if you look at that mission, one thing that is evident here is this, until we can provide clean water, medical, basic Medicare, it means that technically we have not fulfilled our mission. You know, I studied in the Johns Hopkins University where everything you are doing in that school was really about medicine. You see a professor of mathematics in the under modeling of bone marrow. What this man has been doing for the last 45 years is using mathematical equations to describe the bones in human systems. You see people that are specializing in linguistic on communicating medical stuff. If you look at them, everything is being organized. You see engineers doing all kinds of things, but they now package them. You see that medical doctor putting on that nice white stuff. But behind that medical doctor, there are tools. Behind that medical doctor, there are processes. And most of those processes and tools are engineered by engineers. And they are provided by engineers, meaning that you empower the world through the innovations and things you create, you know, in our market. And when you empower the world, beautiful things begin to happen. And in Africa today, we are looking for those engineers. Because think about it. A continent is about $3 trillion GDP with more than 1.2 billion people. America has about 330 million people and they have a GDP of 30 trillion. And look at Nigeria specifically, we are sub 500 billion in GDP. When, just look at our population, America is about 100 million more than us. In absolute sense of it, the lower GDP in Nigeria should be, it's a three trillion. Meaning that everything we have in that country has to be multiplied by a factor of six. So, but if we look at it, if engineers rise in agriculture, beautiful things will happen. If engineers rise in healthcare, beautiful things will happen. And we are not just talking about engineers talking, but talking about engineers doing what engineers do, which is translating invention society into innovation society, just like the Americans rose and saw their GDP that was flattened for centuries and did something that that GDP that was flattened for centuries began to rise in an exponential way. The Chinese did the same thing and they rose. Time for Nigeria, time for African engineers to rise. Because the constellation that happened here was something that happened in America in 1791. Samuel Hopkins was given the first US patent. And when he received that first US patent, there was a transformation in that. I know that there will be a time issue, so I need to make this thing a little faster here. So one factor is this. We need to get into that spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism. And I want to say this, gentlemen and ladies, that our ability, our capacity is we need to become those engineers that have the mindset of entrepreneurs. We need to have that mindset that this engineering call has not ended or has not been executed to the last level until we can now begin to build stuff that can actually help to create process services that can serve society. 
you know, in economics, they talk about the needs of customers. They are also postulated that solving the needs of customers may not really be the most important thing. Ability to also look at expectations and the perceptions of customers become a very, very critical part of the market system. When engineers look at these needs, when engineers cannot see the expectation, we become a better one. What do I mean by that? Let's assume that I'm an environmental activist in Enugu and you're giving me a legacy from coal. You've met my needs, but you have not met my expectation. And let's also assume that you've met my expectation. Have you met my perception? What I'm saying here is that the 21st century engineer to understand that market systems need us to deliver the best possible we can deliver. You know, very, very soon this year, possibly there will be a new iPhone. And on that day, if you go to New York, you see your men, they will take a day out of work. Say, oh, supervisor, Apple is launching a new iPhone. I will not come to work next week. Say, so what? He's taking a day out of work. And this is an hourly wage guy. If he doesn't come to work, he doesn't get paid. 4 a.m. in the morning, he leaves his house to go and kill a best buy in New York because he wants to buy something. Then 10 a.m., they allow him into Best Buy. He takes $1,400. That is his money he earns every two weeks. He gives it out, they give him an iPhone. He comes back into his house. He wires his house. He's tweeting. He's Facebooking. He's doing everything. He has the real latest iPhone. That is an engineering product. The iPhone is an engineering product. And what has happened here is that the iPhone has built perception into that product, making it possible that people do not just see this as an ordinary phone, but they have seen it as something so amazing and so cool. The question for you, as you are an engineer that wants to turn to become an entrepreneur, do you have that level? Do you have that capacity not to be meeting the needs, expectations of customer, but to can actually meet them at the level of perception? The greatest companies in the world are companies that can move beyond and move into that level of perception. I say that you have to turn those consumers into customers and turn those customers into fans. When customers become fans, beautiful things happen in companies. In my business, the Kita Capital, we've invested in dozens of startups around the world. And one thing that we have noted, that when you see entrepreneurs who are visionaries that can anticipate, not even what focus groups tell them or what surveys tell them, but they can anticipate and imagine a future unborn. They want to build and create products for that future. You see great things. There are a group of two young men in Lagos, Olamide, Michael, I think Kabiru, three of them. They started a company called Touch and Pay. They called vividly three years ago. I visited their office. They were still having about 1,000 users. But when I got into the office, I said, guys, hey, this is really cool. 1,000 users processing about $10,000 a month. Say, guys, you have something really amazing. That business today is a company that powers carry card in Lagos State. But within three years, it has moved from 1,000 users to 3 million users. It processes so much money today that most banks in Nigeria will be very jealous. But these guys build this thing. Their payment system is not connected to MasterCard, it's not connected to Visa. It doesn't have any networks down. Their system runs 99.99% reliability. And it was ev designed, evolved, imagined, conceived that everything that has always been a problem in Nigeria compensated. And today, they are a category king company. That is what we are talking about, building beyond the needs, being beyond the expectation to the perceptions of your customers. And when Lagos State came, they had the best product. Kanu State government came, they had the best product. Senegalese government, Sierra Leone government. So what am I saying here? Becoming an entrepreneur is not a vacation job. It's a call to mission. And getting that call to mission requires building things 
in what I call the new basis of competition. I don't want to go into too much uh, business element, terminologies here, but we just have to find a, week, a mechanism that we build things that differentiate. So gentlemen and ladies, I want to close by saying something today that as you look down on that beautiful land we have called Nigeria, if you look from the east to the west, the north and the south, look at the boys and girls, men and women, the old and the young, they are waiting for the engineers to do their job. And that means that we need to give them products and services and move beyond this whole talking thing and begin to come up into the market that we can bring that restoration and service the dignity of man and woman, just like University of Nigeria Soka articulated many, many decades ago. Thank you so much, gentlemen and ladies, for inviting me to your program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. That was a round of applause. Thank you so much, Professor. That's um, quite an insightful presentation. I will employ our viewers to please note down your questions. We will go into to the next um, speaker and after which we will take Q and A's and direct it to each speaker. So I call on um, Ohemu Godwin Pius to please introduce our next speaker, Engineer George Okoroma. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on the time zone that you are in. My name is Ohemu Godwin Pius. I'm a public speaker and a tech support executive. It is indeed an honor for me to introduce our next speaker for today to us. Our next speaker for today is the immediate past president of the Association for Consulting Engineering in Nigeria, Aken. He graduated as a civil engineer in 1981 from the Paul Sabatia University, Toulouse, France. He holds a master of science degree in project management from the University of Roehampton, United Kingdom, and he sits at the helm of affairs at Gambetta Group A Limited, a group of companies with major professional interests in engineering and technical consulting services, oil and gas, EPIC projects, transport and logistics, information technology, hospitality, contract staff management, and manpower development and real estate. He is a prominent and active member and fellow of various professional associations in Nigeria and abroad, including fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, fellow Nigerian Institution of Civil Engineers, fellow Nigerian Institution of Structural Engineers, fellow Nigerian Institution of Highway and Transportation Engineers, fellow Institute of Management Consultant, member American Society of Civil Engineers, member Nigerian Institute of Management Chartered, member Institute of Safety Professionals, member Institution of Diagnostic Engineers, United Kingdom, and is also a council member of the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria, current from 2020 up until 2021. Our next speaker for today has contributed immensely to the growth and advancement of the engineering profession in Nigeria and abroad. In the area of service to the profession, he was the pioneer chairman, Nigerian Society of Engineers, Omoku brand from 2012 up until 2015, was council member um, for the Association of Consulting Engineering in Nigeria, Aken, from 2009 up until 2012 and 2014 to date. He is also an executive committee member representing Nigeria in FIDIC Africa from 2017 to date, and he is also the honorary treasurer of the organization. He has visited 14 countries, presented papers at various conferences and moderated technical sessions at FIDIC events. In 2004, our next speaker for today diversified his field of expertise and became the principal partner and chief executive officer of GAPEC Consultants Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, join me in welcoming engineer George Chukulewa Okoroma, FNSC JP, as he makes his presentation. Engineer George, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Hemu, for that um, uh, introduction. And also, uh, thank you, uh, my co-speaker tonight, uh, 
professor for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, good evening, um, and I'll say uh, good afternoon and possibly good morning for uh, all our distinguished audience, uh, depending on where you are joining us today. Uh, of course, I've been introduced. My name is Engineer George Tukulungo Koroma. I'm a civil engineer. And it's important to note that I pioneer chairman of uh, NSC Omok branch. Why it's important to note? Because the program tonight uh, has to do with uh, the Niger Civil Engineers. And of course, immediate past president of uh, the Association for Consultant Engineering in Nigeria. I have also served in the current council. Um, it's important for us to note that um, um, CORIN is the Council for Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria. And uh, ACEN is the Association for Consultant Engineering in Nigeria. And of course, it's a pool of independent minded entrepreneurs of the highest technical skill, intellectual competence, and ethical orientation, uh, providing uh, top notch engineering uh, consulting services. Uh, to improve the quality of life of the people of Nigeria. Aken is a member of uh, FIDIC Africa and uh, FIDIC International. Um, permit me uh, to uh, start by congratulating the uh, Nigeria Staff Engineers Glasgow branch and uh, the S School led by Dr. Stephen Oguayi for organizing uh, this uh, public lecture today. Uh, Dr. Stephen, was a member of uh, NSC Omok branch, Nigeria, during my leadership uh, at the branch. I'm happy uh, he is leading a branch of NSC here in Glasgow, United Kingdom. Uh, that means to say that uh, he's learning the rope. Um, this evening, I will be sharing my thoughts with you on this important topic, entrepreneurship for engineers. And my uh, discussion and our conversation will go in this way. Uh, the engineer and the role in society, the entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, the engineer and the uh, entrepreneurship relationship, uh, tools and techniques for uh, entrepreneurship survival. And uh, we'll just take a short um, uh, case study and I will uh, close. Um, it's important that we know who is an engineer. Uh, an engineer is one who has studied engineering from a recognized uh, higher institution of learning, duly registered and certified or licensed to practice in his or her area of competence by an engineering regulatory body of his or her country or region um, of residence. Uh, it's very important to know that. Uh, engineers, of course, we all know, uh, has also been highlighted by the first speaker. Um, engineers are trained in various fields, civil, mechanical, electrical, agricultural, aeronautical, information technology, uh, et cetera. And of course, engineering is the practical application of knowledge of uh, mathematics and sciences to provide of solutions to humanity's physical problems and challenges, thus resulting in the well-being of society. Engineering is the, for me, is the greatest tool for human and national development. As a matter of fact, engineering is development. No development can take place without engineering. And this um, assertion is confirmed by uh, uh, Herbert Hoover, the 31st president of America, uh, 1929 to 1933, uh, in his memoir, he noted that engineering is a great profession. And uh, he stated, and I quote, there is this satisfaction of watching a figment of imagination emerge through the aid of science to a plan on paper. Then it moves to realization in stone or metal or energy. Then it brings jobs and homes to men. Then it elevates the standard of living and adds to the comfort of life. That is the engineer's highest uh, privilege. And it's important that we note that engineers are solution providers and, and um, ensuring that the standard of living of humanity gets better and better every day. Engineers, therefore, are solution seekers to society's 
varied and unending demand for infrastructure aimed at meeting the needs for food, clothing, shelter, medicine, industrial development, and environmental challenges. This also has been uh, mentioned uh, by uh, the first speaker. Um, I would like us to know who is um, who is an uh, an entrepreneur. Really, um, engineers are trained to provide solutions to such a problems. Entrepreneurs simply is an individual who creates a new firm and continue to manage it until it, it is successful. An entrepreneur is one who is very willing and ready to look around him and look for solutions to problems that are within the society. Because in the society we have, we lack so many things. There's actually demand that's around us for products and services. And so the entrepreneur is that person who is very conscientious, who looks around this environment or the world around him and begin to look for those things that are lacking are on actual demand and switch into action by way of providing uh, solutions or products and services to meet those such needs. And that individual indeed should be one who is willing and ready to work for himself and by himself and well prepared to organize and operate a business or businesses in a sustainable manner. Indeed, it's important to note this. So entrepreneurship, therefore, is the concept of developing and managing business venture in order to make profit. But it comes also with challenges. And those challenges are risks that can also be managed. So getting to being an entrepreneur requires that you will face challenges. And those are the things I'm going to discuss in the course of our conversation this evening. And of course, there are different types of uh, entrepreneurship, ranging from the, depending on which climb you find yourself, it could be a business of different types, different technologies, of course, different ownership, size, and of course, um, gender, Related, for instance, uh, hairdressing, for instance, or uh, haircut uh, depends, of course, uh, also on uh, gender. Uh, they may take the form of sole self employed, partnership with friends and family, uh, teaming up with um, perhaps um, artisans coming together as a team, or uh, engineering service firms. It could come as resource exploiters or uh, uh, innovators or of course, uh, business um, aggregators as well. I would like us to look at this, that um, there's a relationship between the engineer and the entrepreneur. Engineers are trained to provide solution to such these problems. Entrepreneurs are also those who look around the environment where they find themselves, and seek for solutions to provide products and services to meet the, those needs. The first thing I mentioned something, that you are hungry. Of course, you need food to eat. Somebody needs to provide that services. Somebody should also be you know, willing and ready you know, to, be, to make provision for such needs. So, By training of the engineer, we were already prepared to be an entrepreneur because that training gives you the knowledge of being a solution provider. The entrepreneur is also one who is also by his exposure 
also providing a solution to the immediate need of the environment. So what we're saying actually is that um, an engineer is already prepared to be an entrepreneur if such engineer is willing and ready. And to succeed in entrepreneurship, Professor Wayne has mentioned quite a lot. I won't go into all that, but what's important for us to know tonight is what are those tools and techniques for entrepreneurship survival? Because one thing is to go to entrepreneurship, how, how do you survive being an, an entrepreneur? Critical is that you need to acquire knowledge, you need skills, and of course, you need competencies. Obviously, you cannot go into being an entrepreneur if you don't have the knowledge that you need for such business venture. Of course, if you don't have the skills, you cannot also be able to do that. And of course, you need competencies as well. And um, we're talking about knowledge. Knowledge acquired from the university and also knowledge acquired from the workplace. Well, all the hard skills also have what we call the soft skills. The hard skills are those things that we learn from the university. The soft skills are those ones, perhaps some of course are also learned in the university because currently, uh, current House for Regulation of Engineering is in the process. Of course, I mean, they are advocating that very strongly. Um, going, they are going back to the university to say, we want to have what we call outcome-based education. What it means is that we want to catch the young engineers you know, from the university, even as they are moving to university, we index them and then follow them through the university, make sure that they have education that is tailored towards the industry. And so they need to have those, not only the technical skills, but also the soft skills alongside, so that when they are coming out from the university, they are ready for the, for the market. And so then of course the soft skills are those skills that has to do with uh, human, resources, skills, communication skills, um, leadership skills, teamwork skills, um, ethical skills, uh, interpersonal relationship skills, uh, time management skills, and critical thinking skills. And of course, um, those skills are acquired, some through uh, the tertiary institutions, but more when we are out of the university and in the workplace. And so, in workplace, current is also very, very serious about the issue of continued professional development. And it's important for us to know this, that um, when you are in the workplace, for those of us who we intend to register with, uh, with current as registered engineers, prior to this time, what used to happen is that you just uh, apply and then you are, you, 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 you are issued a license and then you come every year to renew license. But from, but from now on as forth, Current is saying that we need to catch this, ensure that engineers who are in the, in the industry or in the workplace should have an experience or show us evidence of experience over a period of one year. And then that comes in form of uh, CPD points. So uh, it's important to note this, that for us to be able to prepare ourselves to be entrepreneurs, we must have those uh, knowledge, uh, those skills, and those competencies to be able to uh, function effectively and to have a successful uh, business. In fact, this um, is um, also very much highlighted by uh, Napoleon Hill, who said, and I quote, he said, a person who stops studying merely because he has graduated from a university or a high school is forever doomed to mediocrity, no matter what the people he calls him. He says the way to success is a way of continual pursuit of knowledge. And so it's important that we know that. When we intend to go into business, we need to be ready to continually improve ourselves and to get the right skills in to be able to function as uh, an entrepreneur, even as an engineer, even if you're employing an organization. Secondly, it's important also that uh, an entrepreneur should have a discipline, it must be someone who is disciplined. An entrepreneur is not, or entrepreneurship is not for everyone, it's for only those who are prepared. In fact, if you are not disciplined, then you are not ready to be an entrepreneur. You must have financial discipline. 
You must have time management discipline. You must be able to defer gratification. What I mean is that you don't have to pamper yourself when you start your business. You need to wait until when your business gets to a certain level before you can start thinking of personal gratification. You must work very hard. And, and of course, you need to add, work at all times and, and not um, um, one who is lazy. You must be ready to work and, and then uh, to, so that the, your, your business will survive. So to survive and to become successful in it, as an entrepreneur or entrepreneurship, you must be a highly disciplined person. You must be disciplined enough to save and to put together your business capital, which is important, and to be able to manage your fund, the resources or the money for the business. You have to manage time very well. You also have to uh, be able to manage your materials well. And then, of course, the human resources very, very prudently. You must not become someone who is interested in early gratification or self pampering, like I mentioned earlier. That will end up in consuming or depleting your capital that will be able to um, help your business to grow. But saying that too, it's important to note that you are being careful in managing funds does not also mean that you should not be neat. You should not be untidy because it's important that in, in business, you must present yourself very well to your clients, to your partners, to your investors, and to your financial service providers. It's important that while you are a disciplined person in financing, but you also, also, your husband will be neat. So that uh, it's often said that uh, uh, your first presentation is a letter of uh, recommendation. Thirdly, it's also important to, to learn how to be patient. We're talking about uh, being a successful entrepreneur and to succeed and to survive. Entrepreneurship is not for the impatient. You need to wait patiently for your business to grow, to mature, and to turn around profitably. It often says that the patient dog is the fattest bone. So you have to be very patient in everything you do in order to grow your business. And of course, it's important that you don't take shortcuts and do not rush or be too much in a, a hurry when you are um, engaging uh, in the business of entrepreneurship. Fourth, that is important for you to note is that um, you need to learn how to sell yourself and sell your business. Very, very important. We need to learn how to sell ourselves, our products, and our services to our possible clients and stakeholders. Dana H. Pink, in a book titled To Sell is Human, wrote extensively and stated that we are in the business of selling ourselves in all our daily engagements with people. He described that skill as what we call non-selling sale. That's to say that in our conversation, in our business engagements, we are in the business of selling ourselves. And so it's important that we note that for you to succeed in business, you must be able to sell yourself and to sell the business so that it will get to the destination of success and survival. The fifth point that I need to bring to us is that um, in business, changes come. And when changes come, it's good for us to know that we need to learn how to sniff and to scurry when we notice changes. As an entrepreneur, you need to be ready to face changes when they come, because changes will definitely happen in our business or in entrepreneurship. Dr. Spencer Johnson, in his book, Who Moved My Cheese, um, used cheese as a metaphor for what we want to have in life and when things keep changing. So what we need to do, look around and see how the business is going and follow the trend without being able to identify when changes take place. 
by the time I give you the, the uh, background of uh, my um, um, short story, and my case study, I'll tell you what I did. You know, when you find out that changes are uh, taking place in the environment where you are in your business area, you begin to look for other areas where you can be able to uh, get in and then and also um, find where the cheese is moving and move along with it. So it's important that we also know that um, in business changes will come, but what we need to do is uh, we need to sniff around and scurry to find where our cheese has moved and to find it so that we can um, and grow our business and improve our business and make it better. It could be that the population is moving or population is changing, you need to change with uh, such uh, trends as well. Uh, the sixth item that I need to mention to us is that we need to learn to be optimistic and confident. Confidence is critical to entrepreneurship when starting a business. We need confidence to gain our first customers, we need confidence to convince our investors or attract key members or co-founders to our business. It's very important that we must develop confidence in what we're doing. If you don't have confidence, then it will be difficult for you to really be a good uh, entrepreneur or to get into entrepreneurship. And that follows with optimism. It's, it's essential that we be optimistic in life. Optimism is essential uh, quality for entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur must avoid what we call quick to give up attitude. That must not be part of an entrepreneur. It must be somebody who is, have the spirit of resilience. An entrepreneur must be one who wants to succeed no matter whatever the, the situation is. You learn to be, uh, to have, to be, um, to persevere and always hopeful and to be resilient in the face of challenges or sometimes there could be challenges that you know can be very demotivating, and then that could make one to slack in the business. Um, Dr. Martins E.P. Uh, Seligman, in his book *Learn Optimism*, explain how to break away from "I give up." Anyone who has that spirit of "I give up" cannot be a good entrepreneur. So we need to develop a more constructive way of thinking and to ensure that we remain optimistic, not minding the challenges that is ahead of us. But of course, even when we are um, optimistic, we also go alongside with looking at changes in our environment, you know, and see how the business is going. But in, a, in every case, let the spirit of optimism be always there that I will succeed, I will get there. My business will, will get to the level I have planned it to be. And finally, last but not the least, is that in business or entrepreneurship, we should not be arrogant. A successful business person must be one who is very humble. It's not the one that is proud and one that shows off his shoulders, either to, to, the, uh, to the finance, finance financial persons who, who support the business or partners who are partners in the business, but that do happen sometimes. When we see our business growing to a level when we think that we are comfortable, then we start becoming proud. And then we don't have listening ears anymore. That is what um, shouldn't be as, um, as a, an entrepreneur. So with what I have just been able to articulate this evening, all I have just done is to, um, to challenge us that uh, there are tools and techniques that we need to succeed in, the, in entrepreneurship and to become entrepreneurs. Like I've said earlier, the engineer is already trained to be an entrepreneur, but there are basic things that you need. You need knowledge, you need skills, you need competencies, you must be disciplined person, you must learn to be patient. Of course, you must also uh, know how to sell yourself and sell your business. You must learn how to sniff and scurry when uh, there are changes. Of course, you must also learn to be confident and optimistic and of course, not be arrogant. Um, I would like to just share my experience with you. Um, for those of you who are 
because most of you who are online are calling from um, within Europe and and and, and um, maybe America in another part of the world. Uh, I have been privileged to be a student in this Western world, precisely in France. And you imagine what that means uh, coming from a, a, an English speaking country and find myself in a French speaking nation. Uh, uh, it was quite challenging, but I went through the crucibles of, um, of, uh, of education there. And of course, getting back home, um, then of course, things were not, perhaps not as much as uh, uh, things are today. Uh, there were a lot of pr promises back home then. Of course, after my youth service, I uh, walked away with a firm to be able to gather this kind of knowledge I've just been able to mention to you, you know, acquiring those uh, um, hard skills and the soft skills and those competencies. And it got to the point I have to tell myself, I need to be uh, an entrepreneur. And of course, I, uh, I ventured out, started with a consortium firm, you know, um, and I took up any job that came my way. The first, I can tell you as an engineer, the first job I did was uh, um, building a small generator house. That looks quite mean, you know, for maybe a, 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 an engineer, you know, from, the, from, from, from who studied abroad. At the second job was to do a drainage that has to do with, uh, in a, you know, drainage in Port Harcourt. Of course, every day some person saw me and the, in the drain doing some work there. And um, I, I recall very well, it was, a, it was a, a funny experience. And some ladies who are coming back from the market, who knows me, they say, ah, that's the young man we that came from France. He says that they got out, he's doing got out work, you know, that kind of a thing. Imagine that kind of a feeling. But that, that was the pride for me. It was a, 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 a pride for me to work even in the drain at that time. But the point is that I was running my own company, you know, and then so, and that's how I started in construction. Of course, working with some multinational firms, you know, of course, looking around, I could perceive there are other, you know, services that could be rendered to these, uh, you know, IOCs. You know, um, while doing the construction work, I found out that sometimes they had need for uh, vehicles, for logistics, you know, moving up their, their, their materials. Of course, I had to, you know, venture into it, you know, um, initially by leasing, uh, vehicles for one day, two days, three days. As case. At one point, I must tell you, I had to lease my own personal vehicle, actually, my own personal car that we used in our driving then, you know, to the company uh, for a few days. And before I knew it, it, it took, um, we got for, uh, they took it for like three, four, five months. And uh, at the end of six months or thereabout, I almost recovered the cost of the vehicle. You know, that, so that's what I mean is looking around and uh, sniffing and looking for where there's opportunities, you know, and um, from there, of course, while working with them, I also noticed that, oh, they need uh, some um, human resources services that had to do with uh, graduate engineers who would work in their, in their facilities. Of course, I told them I couldn't handle them, do some training for them as well, and then and hire them out to, to, to the organization. And then we got into that as well, you know, and of, gradually, I also saw there were some uh, deficiencies in the way they were managing their projects. Um, some of the projects were actually not designed. You know, are properly supervised, and um, I I told him, of course, I have what it takes to be able to help them to um, you know make some designs and supervise some projects. So, what in essence I'm trying to tell you is that um, when you find yourself in the in in the business community or as an entrepreneur, what you need to do is look around, sniff around, um, uh, ask what kind of services can I provide for uh, the organizations around me or government or whatever. You know, and when once you're able to identify, you know, such services, go for it. And then you never can tell. Sell yourself. And then, of course, you, you can only do that when you have what it takes to do uh, to render such services. So, it, um, I mean, I don't want to take you for too long um, uh, to tell too much about my history. But what's important thing is there is that um, I encourage um, those of us who are here, uh, you know, in Glasgow and, you know, and uh, cities around the United Kingdom who are members of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, uh, there are opportunities there. Uh, be a member of NSE, register with Corin, and of course, gain the necessary skills and competencies. And um, the opportunities are both here and over and at home as well. You know, so um, anywhere you find yourself, there is. Um, the opportunity to, for you to identify, you know, those uh, entrepreneurship uh, opportunities, and then and go for it. And I can show you uh, when once you are willing and ready. Like I said earlier, uh, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. There are those who may not be able to do that. 
but those who are willing to go in for it, and I encourage any, any engineer because by your training, you are already trained as an entrepreneur. Uh, there are many things that I would love to say you know, on this topic, but I want to stop here today. Uh, to succeed as an entrepreneur, you need, you need knowledge, you need vision, you need work ethics, you need to be focused, you need to be consistent, and there must be commitment and dedication. And when once you have all this, I can assure you that success is on your way. And I want to say um, good luck to our brothers and friends who are listening to us today, that the sky is your limit. Go for it and you'll be a good entrepreneur and you have a good entrepreneurship experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer George Chukulewa Okoroma for that excellent presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have question that you would like to ask, uh, there'll be time for Q&A. And I would like to hand over the, uh, the microphone to my co-moderator, Engineer Ikechuku Mondi, to continue with the proceeding. Thank you so much. And we have a fruitful deliberation. OK. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this uh, lecture series. Thank you, the presenter, Professor Ndubisi and Engineer George. Wow, you, you've really dissolved and diluted uh, the, the subjects today. We really appreciate. I got quite some very good um, information that I need to work on for myself, you know, accumulate knowledge and capability if you really want to be a good entrepreneur, that's good. And uh, one of the reference comment I can quote is that uh, no development can take place without engineers. So this is to encourage us as engineers that we have to start thinking not just technical, but also gaining those soft skills, you know, to be a good entrepreneur. So I would, I'm the technical secretary one for NSC Glasgow branch, I'll be anchoring the question and answer series. So we'll do it in two ways. One, if you have a question, you just raise your hand, you know, and um, when we call you, you unmute and ask your question. Or you can also drop your comments or questions um, in the chat room and I'll also um, present those ones. I see a lot of people are asking for the slides. We will discuss with the presenters and um, and we'll come back to you on that. But all our webinars and lecture series you can find in our YouTube channel at NSC Glasgow. So they are there. You can all follow or subscribe, and you will get both these ones for today and the previous ones we had. There are a lot of um, educative um, um, presentations there that will be very very good. So um, let's go on so that I don't take so much of the time. The first question I want to take is from the chat room from Engineer Patrick. And his question goes that, like this. What can we do to restore the dignity of man and woman using knowledge acquired? And he addressed this question to Professor Ndubisi. Prof, this question is for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Thank you. So the, to restore the dignity of man and woman, I think the most fundamental element will be to meet the basic needs of man and woman. Interestingly, uh, those things have to be built. Those things have to be deployed in the market. Across human history, market system or entrepreneurial capitalism has remained the most efficient paradigm to restore the dignity of man. There is no nation in the world that has actually boosted or supported its citizen without to a large extent industrializing. You know, the promises of politicians we say are the taxes of the citizens. And that means that if we hope for us to actually bring that restoration, we actually need to figure out how we can industrialize. Of course, industrialization does not mean just having factories. It doesn't just mean having skyscrapers. Industrialization means here, 
taking care of basic things, not necessarily on the physical infrastructure that you find in those nations. If I go to my village, you know, Vimeravia State, I can tell you that in our minds, my fellow citizens and my brethren, our adults, most of them will feel very confident. They will say, hey, a child born in Ovim in Adia State has a very great future. Because we have figured out a mechanism where the government, they don't have good teachers. I know that I have to contribute 500,000 Naira every, every, every year. They, got, they have put me in a, in a bigger class now. <laughs> And then I go and bring in primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, and now put them in government schools. And now tell them, work with whatever the government has for you, because we want you to be ready. So you look at this community project. At the end of the day, you are trying to make sure that before that child begins to talk about his or her vision, that you have provided basic tools that will actually help that child to thrive. So changing our mindset doing everything necessary to make sure we create opportunities for people is gonna be very critical. And it's key to understand that if you go back centuries ago when Reverend Marcus was talking about that food production was growing in arithmetic progression while human population was going in geometric progression. He was basically saying this, that that dignity of man, decent meal may not be realizable. And as he was talking about that industrial revolution took up, and when that industrial revolution took off, what happened? In America today, when I came here, people, I used to pray a lot in Nigeria. But when I came here, I just realized that you don't have to pray a lot when you want to eat food, though, because eating food now is a problem. <laughs> so you actually try not to eat food. I guess the same thing in Glasgow, because it's not a new industry how people will actually help you not to eat food. But remember in Lagos, remember in your village, food was like, wow, where is the food? So they have flipped what is a problem in most parts of the world into something else. And that is that restoration, abundance, opportunity, that dreams can become true. And if you look at it in all ways, men and women have to engineer those things. And that is a call for mission for every one of us in our generation, especially when it comes to Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we have a question, uh, someone raised his hand. Um, Kenichi Omeka, Omeke, please. Can you unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And thanks to the presenters for their very insightful presentations and uh, also for sharing their practical life experiences. My name is Kenny Chumeki, I'm from this branch. Um, so my question is um, going from, you know, theory to practical. Uh, I, I, will, I will hope that the presenters can share maybe some experiences on getting started. Um, I, I'm glad that um, Engineer Okoroma already talked about how he started, but how do you get your first customer or your first client? That's one. Uh, number two, talking about pricing. How do you know what is a fair amount to charge for your services so that um, you remain competitive uh, against other providers of the same service, but also being able to make a profit so that you can sustain and grow your business? Uh, the final time, uh, question I have is, um, if you're someone who is already employed, like engineer Okoroma did before he became a full-time entrepreneur, how do you know when it is the right time to leave your comfort zone or a job that uh, is bringing in monthly payment and become an entrepreneur. And, you know, I'm asking this because uh, when you're new in business, sometimes you may not get customers. I have a friend who just left Germany and returned to Nigeria to provide them um, data analytics training and other, other kinds of services. But uh, he's struggling with um, getting customers and it's becoming very frustrating for him because uh, he left you know, something he's very comfortable at doing to start mm -hmm. a new business. So these are my questions. I can also post them in the chat just uh, to be sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, I'll hand over to Engineer George to take this question. All right, thank you very much, um, uh, the questionnaire. Um, I can share, uh, I can, feel uh, how you feel um, starting up a business. Yeah, you, you said, uh, how do you start off, uh, you know, getting your first uh, customer or client? 
Um, in my own case, which I have there, you know, narrated to you, um, first you need to have acquired the knowledge, the skills, first and foremost, is very important. And um, when you have the skills, because when you are talking to your first customer or you're, you're talking to your first client, the client will listen very well to, to assess your capacity or ability to provide either the, the product or services that you intend to render to him. And it should be such that when compared to other persons that he, he or she may have had contact with, you are offering something that's um, um, reasonable and new. Maybe the way of packaging could be a different for, a case. For instance, if um, you, you are, take for instance, you are um, as a civil engineer, for instance, and um, you are meeting your first client, probably who ask you to go and arrange to hire a, a grader or a payloader or any type of equipment to bring to site for the work, for instance, okay? Um, maybe other persons may have um, offered probably at the same price, but you probably be the one to go, the, person, the, the client will be the one to go and get the equipment. But you can offer by saying, don't worry, you don't worry. I will bring the equipment to you. So that extra time you are adding or you are, you are, put, you are putting that input you're making is, is, is not, it's an added service, you know, which will probably en encourage um, the, um, the, the client, you know, to, to tag along with you, you know. Um, well, again, the, you talked about how you raise your first uh, capital. Um, like just like I've mentioned in course of uh, you know my presentation, um, you could have worked a while, but if you have not worked and you have good ideas to get into any form of business, especially related to engineering, of course, I've said earlier, it has to be in your area of competence because I can tell you I have an experience which I need to share with you. When I graduated and I came back home, a company, came to me to hire me to be, uh, to work with, uh, 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 with um, a, a computer firm, I, in an ICT. I went for interview. Somebody actually recommended me for this job. And then um, I was supposed to lead some other engineers because they, they found that, okay, oh, he's a graduate from, from, from abroad. Probably he has more knowledge, you know, to be able to manage the other engineers. But in course of a conversation, I discovered that I was going to be a round peg in a square hole. So I, I opted out of that job, but I probably, maybe if I had probably uh, gone with the job, I don't know what would have been the outcome, but I told the, the, the employer, I'm sorry, I would like to work with civil engineers because I better understand them and I can manage them very well. So it's important you know, also that we don't also go to area where we are not sure that we have the competence. And then of course the issue of, ca of uh, capital, you have relations, you have brothers and sisters, you have good ideas. All you need to do is sell this idea. That's why I also talk about selling. You have to sell yourself and sell your ideas to those around you. You may be surprised that just this idea become to a friend or an investor that is interested in what you, you intend to go into. And you just get a, an approval and then you can get into it. So that's one. Then um, you talk about um, when, um, you are employed. I'm employed before I got into my job. Now, but while I was still employed, what did I do? Within the period of that employment, I tried to build capacity. So, what, so if you come in and you're in an organization, when do you want to opt out? When you think that you have quite acquired enough knowledge, skills, and competencies that you can be able to venture out there, why not? But of course, you know that, of course, going out, um, it's difficult to go out from your comfort zone anyway. But then, because for me, I saw a feature in getting out of the comfort zone at that time, I had to opt out. But even when I opted out, it was not easy, I must tell you. It got to the point that even I, I almost lost um, the opportunity of a contract I had. But then, but I, I still persisted. At the point, it was difficult. But when you go through difficult times, the future will definitely be bright. 
That all, again, it depends on trusting in God and looking forward that your effort will be crowned with success. I don't know whether I'd be able to answer your question. Yes, thank you very much. I think um, you you did justice to the question. Thank you, engineer. Yeah, let me. I, I think yeah. let me come in in, in the, the one that has to do with pricing. I think yes, that's prof. the one uh, uh, engineer did not. But so let me just use a, a post I have already written on my blog, the Kidia. Okay. So when it comes to pricing, there are really two core methods organizations use for pricing. There is what they call cost plus markup, and there is what they call value-based pricing. The cost mm -hmm. is basically you look at the cost of production, and then you put something on top of it. Maybe the product is costing you 20,000 Naira. You say, I'm going to put 10%, 20% on it. That is a very, very primitive industrial age business most model because pricing model, because it's not a good way of looking at costing your products or also driving pricing into the market. The best is value-based pricing because businesses are engineered or launched into the market to fix frictions which customers have. That was your capacity to actually deliver value to those users is actually the essence of your business model. So it's not about how much it's costing you to produce that product that should determine how much people have to pay. Rather, is actually modeling the value that you are creating for them. And that is a better. So value-based pricing means I have used 100 Naira to create this product. But the value it is delivering to customers is 20,000 Naira. That is, this is not about the issue of morality, ethical. There is nothing unethical provided you are making this thing self-evident that this customer knows what he or she is paying. So, of course, as you begin to capture that great margin because of the way you are pricing, you're going to see a lot of competitors coming in because good margins, everyone wants to also go and attack the same opportunity. But how do you really build that model? It comes back to what we call marginal cost. The most important cost element in market system is the cost of serving an additional user in a business. The additional user of a business basically says that if you can serve that additional user in a business at a cheaper cost model to the ones that you're already serving on average, it means that you can actually scale or grow that business. And that is where we get what we call unit economics. So let me explain it this way. In industrial age business, this is how the cost of your marginal cost looks like. So as product output increases, in other words, you're making more stuff, the cost per unit of making each of those marginally will drop. So sure. a company that is producing 1,000 phones, and all of a sudden that company is now producing 10,000, you realize that as the output increases, you are going to get what the cost per unit of that product to drop. But remember, from moving from that 1,000, 10,000 to 1 million, there is going to be a point where instead of the cost per unit dropping, the cost per unit begins to go up because you have exceeded your marginal cost point. So what is this thing telling us? It's telling us that you cannot have engineering factories in every local government if you are running a business in Nigeria. You cannot have branches of a bank in every street in Nigeria because the more branches you have, at the beginning, it can increase your ability to grow revenue. But over a time, it begins to actually become a diminishing return. Go back to your secondary school economics, you must have been exposed to the law of diminution return. That if you add a variable factor into a fixed factor after a period of time, that you're going to see an increase in the total output. But once you pass a certain inflation point, even as you are adding the variable factor, the total output begins to drop. They always use fertilizer and land as an illustration in those textbooks in secondary school. So you have a piece of land, one plot, you put fertilizer, the output of yam or cassava or gari, whatever it takes, will grow up. But after a time, even as you're putting more fertilizer, the output of that farmland is not yielding much. So let's look at the digital companies. These are now companies like Naira Land, Facebook, Instagram. If you look at as output increases, 
their marginal cost efficiency does never deteriorate. What that means is that these businesses are built to scale unbounded by geography or unconstrained by any factor. In other words, adding 1,000 users will not cause you problem. Adding 1 billion users will not cause you problem because there is an asymptote. You remember in mathematics, this curve is trying to touch. They never touch in the final space until they get to infinity. So that means if you are pricing a product whose marginal cost is like this, you have a lot of freedom. And that freedom is captured in what we call, let me show you this one here, just sorry, trying to teach here, but just closing it here. So you see this, so the greatest reward for, for a digital business, for example, is when your marginal cost begins to go near zero, even as the number of users, your revenue is increasing. So your job is to make sure that your distribution and transaction costs, both of them stay low, even as you are growing users and growing revenue. If you can do this, you become like a boobah tree that will begin to take over a forest because you can scale, build a rapidly growing business. In short, gentlemen and ladies, this is what we do in investing in all these startups. When they come with all those, they are pitched them. You analyze how efficient their marginal cost can enable them to grow. If you look at the marginal costs in a way that they cannot grow, you don't invest in them. Because the business model you run determines how far you can go as a business than even the effort you are putting in that business. There are businesses in this world, if you bring the smartest men and women in the world to run, no matter how much effort they put, they will not be profitable. For example, I've written extensively in Harvard that don't waste your time in B2C e-commerce in Nigeria because you're never going to be profitable. I wrote that piece in 2010. A lot of people are talking, but I have looked at the cost more though that underpins, underpins the e-commerce sector in Nigeria. And I cannot see any how anybody can make money in the B2C market. So costing is now mathematics. And you have to understand that equation very well because it's not just a question of trying anything you want to try. You need to understand your business model so that you can position yourself in a place where you keep distribution costs low, put transaction costs low, even as users and revenue. And of course, the fees cost is fairly marginal. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for uh, really going deep in that cost um, analysis. Thank you, Thank you very you. much, uh, yes. so, Prof. Yeah, yes. I've been a long time follower on LinkedIn and uh, been a contributor on Tekeli as well. Uh, I really appreciate your, your efforts. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Prof, um, Prof, we have two questions. I will take two questions together because time is of an essence. Um, one is a general question from Engineer Sharp. He's asking, um, is the cost engineering enterprise still taught in our institutions? And if not, he's also advising um, uh, NSC to sponsor this with NUC. That's one. So is that course still taught in Nigerian universities? Then engineer Simon, our secretary asked, um, he started with a comment saying, if a nation must grow, its economic value engineering must be the driving footprint in which the development lies. This has been, this being said, how can the engineer entrepreneur acquire or get basic applied commercial and quality principles in engineering? to ensure that he succeeds in entrepreneurship, considering reasons for costs, control, and breaking even against facing competition, competitors. So more or less, how can engineers get more commercial knowledge? Because what's, what he just showed us is something that is very, very deep, just the cost uh, present, um, slide he showed. I think this is something you, you need to get an additional education or something, or an MBA to be able to, to, to grow there. So that's the questions. So we'd like you to throw a yeah. little more light, how engineers can really get commercial skills and um, also mm -hmm. how this can also go into the ed our educational curriculum in Nigeria as well, because it should mm -hmm. start from there. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you so much. And I would say largely that our curriculum is actually good. The problem is that we never get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, in secondary school, uh, my mother forced me to do 15 subjects because according to her, 
Why would they say nine? Because that's what Waik recommended. Say no. So what will you be doing when they are doing the other six? <laughs> so I so said, everything in school, just do it. That's why you're in school. So, you know, we got to Futo a semester of uh, eight, sorry, five, six months. They will say it's one month because of strike. Nigerian educational syllabus or curriculum, we are really fine. The problem is that 90 something percent of time, I mean, I don't know now, uh, when I was in Futo uh, a couple of years back, we were never getting to the last part of that program. So if you take this course, engineering economy, most universities in the University of Technology structure like Futa, Futmina, Futiola, uh, Futo, and Amadou, uh, Abu Akita Fabula One University, they always teach that course in their third year. But it's actually at the last part of the semester. By that time, there must be one strike why they will not get there. So the accounting part of engineering management, those things were in the books. So the problem there is that nobody gets there because even when there is no strike, our faculty or professors, they are not even in the urgency of finishing their syllabus because there's no, I mean, Nigeria is a place there is no repercussion for not doing your job right. Just wait for five years, you'll be promoted to another level, you wait for another five years. So, but if in a society where there is a repercussion or if you don't get that job done, you don't get promoted. Like I like the way they do it in America. You can just start within three years, become a full professor. Whether nobody cares, it's about what have you done and not necessarily how long have you actually been there. So what that means is you need to get in there, demonstrate competence and capability. And once you do that, their system will reward you. But that is not the case. So I don't think the problem is the curriculum. I think we have a very good one. Our challenge is we never get to the end of our academic curriculum. Many Nigerian graduates, when they come to the United States, we all do well. We all do very, very well. Yeah, I, I don't, we don't struggle, especially those that actually paid attention in school. So uh, that, that's what I will say there. And then uh, what the National Council of Engineering or, now, or current Council of Regulation of Engineering can do. I think where we need to really pay a lot of attention from my own angle, having been in the National Science Foundation United States is we, we don't have to see engineering as just this theoretical construct where we have to write exams, people get all this. We have to see it in a way that industries will actually improve our engineering profession. I know of a company that wants to build a semiconductor plant in Nigeria. One of the difficulties is where, where are you going to source the chemicals that are needed in photolithography, oxidation, all those zoocrastic methods, flotations on process that you go during semiconductors. So when we did the analysis to say, hey, listen, if you do this and set up this plant in Nigeria, you are going to import all this chemical because there is no chemical company that can supply you those chemicals in Nigeria. So why don't you just bring in the microchip from China instead of coming to make it in Nigeria? So you see that integrated interwoven system where if the chemical engineering is not dynamic, the electronics engineering cannot work. And if the electronics engineering and the mechanical engineering cannot work. So, but if you see from the angle of industries, that is actually where the engineering profession will be. So we just need to have better incentives for people to go and build companies so that people can have internship, learn little things, develop technical skills, instead of today where all of us started in banking. Myself, I started in banking when they were paying more money than what any giant company would pay me. And they would just know what you're going to convince me not. I want to have a new car. I want to put on, you know, that's it. <laughs> but of course, we recovered when we, because America offers opportunity. But not many people have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll take one last question because of time. And I will just give um, the two presenters just um, 30 seconds to just make a closing remark in form of an advice for the young people, especially because sometimes we have students 
um, in this uh, forum, you know, some word of advice, 30, 30 seconds. So in Shegu, please, can you um, um, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Engineer Okoroma and uh, Prof. Um, I've got two questions and one is for, the first one is for Engineer Okoroma and I think it's similar to what Engineer Kene asks. Practically, if you want to start out as an engineer, what are the things you need to put in place practically as a setup for you to operate effectively and efficiently? And then the second question is for Prof. Um, are there particular business model that suits an engineering entrepreneur, you know, more than, than the other entrepreneurs that you find around? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shagun. The, I go straight to the answer, straight away. Your knowledge, your skill, your competencies. Take for instance, as a, a, a civil engineer, if I have the skills, if I have the competence, if I have the, uh, the knowledge, I can walk into any site, anywhere, introduce myself to the site manager or site engineer and say, look, you know what? This is what I can do for you. If I, sometimes I've even uh, advocated this to some young persons, you can come to my side and say, this is what I can do for you. Today, even if it means just not paying me, but try me out. Let me tell you a story of a young man. A young man that came to me uh, many years ago. Uh, he, he, I have a, a civil engineer, my company is a civil engineering firm, but he came in as a petroleum engineer. But when he came to me, he said he can do, uh, he has knowledge in AutoCAD and he can do design. And then he showed me his, um, you know, um, process um, pipeline design. And then I said, but can you use it to do uh, civil engineering design? And he said, yes, I gave me a plan. And he's able to give me a, a civil uh, plan, okay, of a building. That's what gave me the job. Because you had you had you had the skill, you had you know, you, as a lot of time it was difficult to have young men who are very you know skilled in AutoCAD, for instance. Today I have this challenge with just so many young persons. You know what they do? They come to me and say I'm looking for a job. Oh, I graduated from university. And I say, please, what can you offer? Do you know how to use AutoCAD? Simple to AutoCAD. They say we don't know. So which software do you know? I don't have any idea. So you are not even armed yourself with a software that can help you to even access the industry. How do you render service to people? So it's important that you have your knowledge and skills and competencies, and you can be willing to offer it there. People are looking out for those who have competence, those who have the skills, and those who have the knowledge. You are ready to go. Thank you. Prof, yeah, you take the second part of the, of the question. OK. Uh, is, what is the second part? So I think the uh, engineers basically. Um, okay, so the, the second question is about business model. I think you mentioned yeah. that. Okay, and entrepreneurs. Part, so, mm. Yeah, which one suits an engineering entrepreneur better, if there is? Yeah, um, so of course, in business, the most important thing in business is actually business model. And business model is that construct where you now create value in a particular business. I have a very well-received uh, article in Harvard on that where I wrote, are you capturing value in that particular business that you are doing? So when it comes to a business model, you're looking at the thing which actually determines the success of a business. The board of a company recruits the CEO and together they recruit the executive management of a company. And the CEO and the executive management, there is one important job they do. They commit that company into a business model. So when the business model is faulty in the market or business, that company has no future, no matter how hard they work. That is the reason why company had changed the business model because a new CEO has taken over and that business now begins to take over. I'll give you a particular example before I go straight into that question question here. If you look at the, G, the, 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 the market cap of IBM and Microsoft in 2009 to 2012, they were at parity, around 100, 200 
billion. At 2014, Microsoft was around $336 billion. IBM was around $200 billion. IBM was run by uh, Steve Barmer, was the CEO of, uh, sorry, Microsoft was run by Steve Barmer as the CEO. And Steve Barmer has this purity in how he was running Microsoft. And uh, so one thing happened, he did not believe that even though Windows had lost to Android and iOS in the mobile world, he did not want to give up. He still believed that one day that Windows was coming to win. He did not make it easy for people to use their iPhone, their Apple devices to connect into the Microsoft ecosystem. He believed the world has to wait until Microsoft Windows will be ready. They changed him in 2014, brought Nadella, Satya Nadella. This man now changed the Microsoft business model using the same staff, using the same product. Gentlemen and ladies, in less than five years, the market cap of Microsoft moved from $336 billion to $1 trillion. What am I saying here? The same products, the same people, but a, a new business model changed the destiny of that company. I can give you many instances how business models have played a significant role. So what am I saying here? You are an engineer. It's not a question of having a product. It's a question of what is the path to capturing value in the market. That is the hypothesis upon which you can actually build a business that makes sense. So you cannot underestimate the power of the business model you want to commit. What is really a business model? Am I going to run a subscription business model? Am I going to run a freemium model? Am I going to run an advertising-based model? These are choices that are coming out of your strategic framework. And out of those choices, you pick one. Ability for you to know the one that can create value for your customer and also help you capture value. You know, in Igbo Nation, we say, Oabahia, the world is a marketplace. And every good person that goes to the farm, you need to go and shop and buy and also come back. How will you go to the market, Oriental market in Abia State? And after all, you don't have something you are bringing home. That is the value you are capturing in the market. So an engineer has to examine a business model. And there are so many components of looking at that business model. Just because of time, give this. IBM had more than, how many quarters that IBM was losing revenue? Up to nearly 20 quarters under uh, Jenny, as in Rometi, uh, uh, the former CEO, the lady, and they changed her, brought a new CEO. You know what happened? The next quarter, IBM that was losing revenue over more than nearly 22 quarters, revenue started going up. You know what he did? He changed the business model of IBM. And if you can change a business model and get the right one, businesses begin. So if you're an entrepreneur, gentlemen and ladies, your job is cut out for you. The best companies in the world are companies that engineer. And today, if you're running a digital business, there is one business model or the top 20 digital companies run. We call it aggregation constructs, an element of aggregation. If you look at all the top digital companies in the world and online, they have one thing in common. They have an aggregation as part of their business plan. So in other words, that's already a validation that if you're not doing something that integrates aggregation, you can never scale at the level where you become a category king in that particular sector. And you can now make money, go to your village and take a chief city title. You know, chief city title is no more for women, for men these days. I know that women are also taking chief city title. So when I say chief city title, it means our sisters also can take a chief city title. And when you take it, those dancers will come because you know what? The alpha has arrived. What is alpha? It means you have beaten the basic metrics of the market because you have introduced something that is super awesome. Your business model has won. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, um, this is the last question we're going to take. I will just give um, Prof and Engineer um, 30 seconds for a closing remark, um, maybe in form of advice or what, what you feel. 
So I will start with Prof. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's quite a great uh, privilege here to have me here to collect and share these perspectives. One thing I will say here, uh, anywhere you are, and if you're in Glasgow, compound how much you make per hour and not working all hours. If you are making 30 pounds per hour today, ask yourself as an engineer, how can you make 70 pounds per hour? And not, if you are working eight hours in a day, how do you work 12 hours in a day? That is for people that are not strategic. So it could mean getting certification, it could mean getting another educational qualification, but focus on how do I improve how much you make per hour instead of all the hours piled up. If you do that, you just realize that you can even retire uh, before your, uh, your sister birthday. Thank you and good luck everyone for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, Engineer George, please, 30 seconds, closing remark. Thank you, Thank sir. You very, thank you very much. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone, but those who are ready. Is it a school of hard knock with the promise of a happy ever after if we faint not? All I can say, I wish you a wonderful journey into entrepreneurship. The sky is your limit. The future is bright. That's great hope. Why not take this journey now? And we see ourselves at the end of it. Great success. Thank you.